So Al Miller um, has been at Lehigh for over 20 years, and Al Alan uh, Al uh, runs. Uh, you're this guy. Yes. Um, You can activate it. Where do you activate it? It is a new slot. It's a new slot. So, um, so where, where do you want it? Where, oh, there. I see it there. Okay. Problem with my progressive. Okay. Uh, Alan has been here since about 1988. Some of you know Alan. He's the guy that's running. Uh, the higher the resolution XPS system, uh, uh, which is unique. Uh, it's the only one that, that, that in North America, to my knowledge. Right? Right. Yeah. And so Al gives a brief um, introduction about this instrument, and then we're going to have another lecture about applying both XPS and applying scattering to the processes to looking at glasses. Afterwards, if you haven't seen the program, we have a poster outside. It shows an application where people have used these instruments for different uh, technological applications at any time. And you, you can talk to depending on the of interest. And then afterwards, we'll go to the labs, which is the next building in Sinclair. And you can further interact with us and, and also see the instruments. So, Alan? Thanks. Thank you. Here's point. Um, as uh, Dr. Wax pointed out, I've been here for about 20 years, 22 actually, came with the Sienta. Uh, I'm going to give a very, very brief overview, and I would suggest I'm down in Sinclair. If you've got specific questions, to come down and, and beat up on me anytime. Uh, I, I might also point out, at least in the interim, that I'm going to be working with the low energy ion scattering instrument, and uh, actually that's kind of returning home for me since my dissertation involved using low energy ion scattering. So I'm, I'm familiar with both. If you've got a particular problem you want to discuss, uh, either from inside or outside the community, feel, feel free to come down and talk to me and we'll see what we can do. There are tremendous complementary techniques. The outer surface layer is a, is a wonderful thing, but sometimes you need a little bit more than that because you're not getting any chemistry, uh, or very much chemistry anyway, out of the low energy ion scattering. Uh, probably, since it's one of the most established techniques, most of you are familiar with the principles of it, uh, so I've only got uh, not a great deal of, uh, of information associated with that, so we'll uh, quickly look at the, the very simple sort of situation. With XPS, you have a photon in and a photoelectron out, and you measure the energy of that electron when it comes out, and that energy is the difference between the photon energy and the binding energy of whatever the levels are within the atom. Uh, the escape depth is approximately 10 nanometers or thereabouts, which means that's the volume zone from which you get information. And no, it's not a perfect surface technique, but frequently there are sufficient concentrations to be able to learn something about it in any event. The other peaks that appear in XPS spectra are OJ peaks. Uh, typically, that's thought of as being an electron beam hitting the sample surface, but you do get them uh, in the XPS spectra. And it's because once you've established that core level hole, you can have a de excitation of the excited atom via that OJ process that's a schematic to, uh, lower section of that curve. This is a general schematic of the instrument that Lehigh has. Uh, the unique, one of the unique features of this is that rotating anode you see down there, which allows you to put out as much as 7.5 kilowatts of X-ray energy. Uh, I haven't been running it that high for a variety of technical reasons, but 4.5 kilowatts is typically it, and you've got uh, a high throughput lens and multi-channel detecting so that you can get uh, a lot of signal fairly quickly when you put both of those together. The spectral information that you get out of it is elemental identification, chemical state. It's quantitative, uh, again, within its in-depth limitations. Uh, you can do depth profiling, though, quite frankly, if I were going to, if somebody came in and asked me to do a depth profile, if it were possible to do it using low energy ion scattering, that would be my first choice. Uh, XPS profiles, because of that escape depth, those are a little, little shaky sometimes. Lateral distribution of surface elements in chemistry, you can do XPS imaging. It's not certainly at the uh, nanometer scale. Uh, perhaps you can do uh, a few microns in terms of lateral distribution. One of the things that uh, 
uh, one of the limitations that you occasionally encounter with low energy ion scattering is the fact that the peaks are very close together. Usually you'll have enough peak separation in the XPS spectrum to be able to identify which of the elements you're dealing with. And then if you want to go back and do the ion scattering, it's a, again a complementary way of being sure to identify what you have on the surface. As you can see, the peak, uh, the spectra can become extremely busy in terms of the number of peaks you have. Um, usually you can do all of the identification you need to do. Sometimes there's an advantage to being able to get a little bit of depth information, uh, and a case of that would be associated with silicon uh, dioxide layers on SiO2. The relative areas of those two peaks can be related to the thickness of the oxide layer, and in certain circumstances you can make that extremely accurate, uh, SiO2 on silicon happens to be one of them, uh, and you can actually get a thickness, if it's meaningful, uh, to within a, a fraction of an angstrom in terms of the thickness of the layer on that by making measurements of the, the two areas, uh, there being a formula that relates those. One of the things that you can do to improve the surface sensitivity on flat surfaces is to do something called angle resolved XPS. A little diagram on the right shows you if you have a copper oxide, Cu cupric oxide, cuprous oxide layer on top of uh, cupric oxide. If you consider a situation where the electrons are coming straight off and, and you have the deepest um, portion of the sample being probed, you'll get the spectrum that you have over on the, on the right here, where this peak here is the oxygen peak associated with the cupric oxide and the other associated with the cuprous oxide. Uh, if you take and rotate the sample, or whatever is appropriate in this case, it's such that you are looking at electrons that are coming off at a very shallow angle, this distance from here to here is the same as it is from here to here. Now you'll notice that the larger path length is going through the overlayer, and so you will enhance the cuprous oxide oxygen relative to the cupric oxide. So it is a way of improving the surface sensitivity, and on flat surfaces, uh, and with the, the Sienta, you can get down to some very shallow angles and improve the surface sensitivity rather dramatically. Uh, you're in trouble with powders on that, but it works very nicely for wafer kinds of, of applications. The XPS imaging <coughs> in, in the Sienta, there are a couple of schemes to it, but uh, what you have is the X direction on the sample is in this direction and the detector. If you play games with a detector, you can make little slices coming out of it, and so you can actually take simultaneously uh, cor correlate the position on the detector with the position on the sample, so that at least in one dimension, uh, you can get uh, uh, a resolution lateral which is limited primarily by the electronics. The, uh, the other dimension is a little more difficult in that you have to step it through mechanically, and if you do an assembly of these things, you can get a full XY chemistry uh, image of the material that you're dealing with. Uh, that's a fairly slow and, and tedious process. So, uh, we, We've talked about detection sensitivity. I know that you have the very surface sensitivity associated with low energy and scattering, but it is also possible to work with, uh, with this. For example, if we take a look at uh, uh, germanium implanted in silicon, we can get down to uh, 10 to the 12 kinds of concentrations, uh, easily 0.1. Uh, so it, it's not the worst scenario, and this is another one. Uh, for example, this was a sample I had from PPG years ago, a, a float glass, and they were concerned about what the concentration of lead was on the surface of float glass, because glass is actually made by pouring the melt onto uh, on the lead, or I'm sorry, tin rather. And uh, this is my estimate. I, I estimated on that basis that in that particular system, you could get down to about 50 ppm uh, as a sensitivity. Again, it depends on the materials. It depends on the couples. Uh, if I were going to do that measurement today, I certainly wouldn't use XPS. But uh, that was then. Uh, this is now. You can. One of the primary reasons that most folks come and want to use XPS is it is near surface at the very worst. And, but you do get chemistry. And so this is a, uh, a spectrum that was taken uh, years ago by some folks out of uh, Bob Way's group with niobium, and they were studying oxidation of uh, some niobium alloys. And you can see the number of peaks which have been created in this, which represent a variety of oxidation states. Uh, very important information for certain uh, applications. 
Thin films, fluoropolymers, again, you're looking at a, uh, this is the primary carbon backbone. Uh, this is a CF2 group on it. This is a terminal CF3 group, together with what is probably a carbon oxygen uh, component as well. And so it's within that world that you can do an awful lot of curve fitting then and, and try and understand better what the chemistry is. Uh, we go into the catalyst world, and now we're looking at a zinc copper catalyst. This was probably something from uh, Camille Clear at one time or another. And we have copper plus one and uh, copper plus two, and some sort of a mixture of the two in between is the uh, uh, oxidation state of the copper and the uh, copper, probably zinc oxide catalyst. Again, looking at the uh, minor amounts of uh, uh, loadings. We are, this is a 0.05 weight percent. Uh, this is a fresh material. This is a used material. And again, <laughs> you, you can get down to some very low concentrations and still be able to get information on oxidation state. If you were wondering how long it took to get this particular spectrum, this probably took about 20 minutes or so to accumulate that at that concentration level. Uh, as uh, Andre is going to talk about shortly, we've looked at a lot of glass surfaces. This is a uh, tellurium potassium tungsten glass, and it was fractured in situ. And by being fractured in situ means that we have virtually no hydrocarbon contamination, and you get the full range of peaks without having been exposed to air. Uh, other studies along this general line with glasses and, and that have been exposed to air and fractures have shown that the changes that can take place in the surface and near surface composition of glasses can happen extremely rapidly uh, within a matter of a few minutes. One of the overlooked areas, or frequently overlooked areas, is the valence band. Uh, kind of a, not the best slide in the world, but this represents the valence band of a variety of carbon materials. Uh, we have single crystal diamond. Notice the characteristic peak that you have associated with the diamond structure here as we go down through to pyrolytic graphite uh, and, and some of the others. So that it's a more qualitative and quantitative unless you have someone that wants to spend a lot of time working on the structure of the valence band. Uh, but if you were to say, bring me a piece of polymer and say, am I looking at polyethylene or polypropylene because the survey spectrum shows nothing but carbon, you would be able to distinguish between those two very easily on the basis of looking at the valence band. And it only takes 10 or 15 minutes to get a valence band, which would allow you to be able to at least make a qualitative identification or probable identification of some of the uh, polymeric components. As I said, I've depth profiled, though it's not my first choice to use XPS to depth profile. Uh, this is beryllium oxide on a beryllium nickel alloy. Uh, again, it was a commercial sample that came in, so I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what the preconditions were. Uh, Monolayers of uh, fluorocarbon and silicon, again, same kind of idea, uh, where you have carbon-carbon bonds, CF2 and CF3. Uh, this was another commercial sample that came in. It was uh, quite some, some number of years ago, but this is plain ordinary cotton cloth. And uh, over on the side here, we have the blank cotton. And this is what happens to the surface of the cotton fibers as you go through and wash it. And so after five washings in standard detergent, 10, uh, the temperature of the water has been changed. And you can see how the carbon 1S peak has been changing so that the surface of the cotton fibers is a function of its treatment. Very practical sort of industrial sample. And uh, again, over the years, we've looked at more different kinds of uh, industrial samples than you can imagine. So we have the advantages. Uh, I won't belabor any of those. I want to just quickly read through them. And if we uh, go back to the features that we have associated with the Sienta, we have high power rotating anode source, multi element monochromator, high throughput, channel plate, small stat, automated stage for multi position analysis and charge compensation. And in addition to that, we have sample preparation resources, which represent in situ heating and cooling, fracturing, scraping rather than sputtering to clean a surface, argon ion etching if necessary. We can do thin film depositions, gas exposures at high and low pressures, residual gas analysis, and there is a lead available on the surface. Uh, so that uh, pretty much takes care of what I have to say. And again, to keep things moving along, uh, I, I would suggest perhaps if you've got questions to come over and visit me in Sinclair uh, later on this afternoon or give me a telephone call and we'll talk about anything that you might be interested in.